Take your Bible, turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. And I think this is the last sermon that I'm going to preach on debt and being in debt and how God has delivered us from that debt. 2 Kings chapter 4, we'll read down verses uh, 1 through 7. I have it up on the screen, but I want you to open your Bible up. Did anybody else, while we're, while we're doing this, anybody else have a, just a word of testimony? Just something blessed them this week and they'd like to share that. It seems like I was, I'm forgetting something. It seems like, I probably, maybe not, but I just want to make sure. Uh, I mentioned Kurt Carmichael, didn't I? Okay, let's be sure and pray for the Carmichael family. Um, Kurt loved this church. They, you know, they loved uh, the fact that Jimmy was here. And um, Linda really has just stepped in and done a lot for that family. And so that's where she is now. And they probably were not going to have church this morning um, down at their church. And so I think she's watching. So Linda, we love you. And uh, I just, I have you on my mind this morning. That's why I thought about it. So um, we miss you and we're praying for you. Anybody else? Just a word of testimony before we get into the scriptures. Yes, Alicia. Amen. Amen. I want you to understand. I know about it. Uh, because I, I hear about it. But usually, every time Michael goes over there, the devil goes to work. And goes either goes after him, goes after Alicia, somehow, some way. And um, it's because of what God is doing over there. And what, you know, when he comes to me and says, I need to go to Kenya, I just... I cringe uh, because I know what he's going to get into once he goes over there. When they, he was at the office, when they came in and said, we're going to try to shut you down. And um, that's bold on their part. That, that means that they hate us and they hate this church and they hate what we say. And... Um, so I appreciate Michael probably more than what I say publicly, but I appreciate him and the work that he does over there. And he's going to come to me again and say, I need to go and I'm going to cringe, but we're going to cover him in prayer and God's going to put a hedge about him. Amen. So just always pray, keep in mind and pray for him and pray for the work over there. Second Kings chapter four, verse one, there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What is thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. You know that pot of oil represents your Bible. When you don't have anything else, you've got the Word of God. Be thankful for what you have. Amen? Our forefathers who went through depression, who struggled just to have enough food on the table to barely feed themselves, they bowed their heads in reverence and thanksgiving and told God thank you for what little they had. And we have abundance and sometimes forget to thank God for it. Amen. So it's not when we have a lot that we think about God. Usually it's when we have absolutely nothing or almost nothing. And then God reminds us that we do have one thing. We have that pot of oil. We have the word of God. We have prayer. And, though, and through those things, God can give and bless his people and take us out of debt. So he says in verse 3, then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. And shalt pour out into all those vessels 
Thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she uh, went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there's not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil, pay thy debt and then live thou and thy children of the rest. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you, God, to lead in this message. Guide me, Lord, show me where you would have me to go in the scriptures, what scriptures to give, what to say, what not to say. Father, I want to be a blessing to these people here. I love them. They're my friends. They're my family. They're the ones, Lord, that I see from Day to day, week to week, and I care about them. I thank you, dear God, for our visitors. And I pray that you'd bless them. And I thank you, Lord, for those that are with us online. Those that are in Kenya. Those pastors, Lord. That man that is helping to interpret, Lord, what I say. I pray, dear God, that you would give him blessing. God, give him the words in their language. Father, you promised that with men of other tongues and other lips would you speak unto your people. And I just believe, God, that what will come out of, Lord, the man's mouth, Lord, will be your word for them in their language. And you, you'll make it plain so that they'll understand. And Father, one thing that we all understand and comprehend is debt. And what we owe against what we have or what we don't have. And Father, nothing in my hand I bring Simply to the cross I cling. Father, remind us, Lord, that our debt has been cleared. And we owe nothing. And not only that, but from this day forward, we'll owe nothing ever again. Father, remind us of the one who paid that debt. And we thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for the cross, and we thank you for the blood that was shed. That the battle that was fought at Calvary, and the man that died, to pay our debts. Father, just open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, to your scriptures. Bless around the world, Lord, as we preach. Father, bless the word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, if you remember here a while back when I preached this, I mentioned this. And verse 7 tells us that not only were the debts paid that they had racked up, but there was enough oil left. Oil was their life. Oil was how they cooked. It was how they ate. It was how they lit their lamps. Oil was everything to them. It was their life. She not only had enough oil to pay all the debts of the past, but she had enough oil that her and her two sons would be able to live I, I read this and he said, live thou and thy children of the rest. I kind of get it in my mind that this oil that she had for the rest of her life never ran out. She always had enough to not only take care of her needs right then and take care of the needs of the past. But I believe that this is an example of what Christ has done for us, not only about the sins that are present with us, those sins and that debt was paid, but I believe that our debt is paid forever. While we're in this life, our debts remain paid by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the cross. Can I hear somebody say amen? Where am I at? I ain't to the end of my message yet. Turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. That threw me. I'd read that and the screen went off and I thought, well, I guess I'm done. But I'm not. We're going to end up. I'm kind of leading up to. Um, Deuteronomy 15. There's something beautiful in the law. And God reminded me what it was about this morning. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 16. The Bible says for he verily took not on him the nature of angels. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things. 
And underline this in your Bible. Keep this in your mind. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That means Christ became us. It behooved him to come and live our life. To know what it's like to be hungry. To know what it's like to be thirsty. To know what it's like to be in want. To know what it's like to suffer in our flesh. Uh, to have to have pain in his body. He knows what that's like. So that, verse 17, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Reconciliation. I taught this here a while back. Is when your checkbook lines up with what the bank statement says, we call it reconciled. When you are in agreement with the bank and, and the money that you show in your checking account or your ledger, in fact, I got a picture of it, the, the amount that you show in your ledger and the bank's ledger, when those both match up, I come in here sometimes, I see Rose with, frustrated, throwing papers around. I was, Rose, what's the matter? I can't reconcile the church account with what the bank says. And I know her. She'll work that day. She'll work that night. She'll work the next day. And finally, she'll come in three days later. She says, I got it. Got what? She said, I found it. I found out where the mistake was made. I found out the check that, that you know didn't get sent out or whatever. She said, I finally found it. We're reconciled. And to her, there's not a feeling like it. When you recognize that your sin racks up a debt with God, that God is always keeping a record of it. God's book in heaven records every sin, every thought of sin. See, thought of sin is a sin, is it not? Hate is a thought. It's something in your heart and something in your mind where you hate somebody. You may never act on it. I guess in some ways you will because there are just some things to somebody you hate. They're just things you just won't do for them. But it's a thought in your mind. Lust, covetousness is a sin of your mind and of your heart. And things where nobody else can tell you're doing it. God knows you're doing it, and an angel writes it down in a book. Somebody writes it down in a book, and it's there, and it's against you, and it must be dealt with. It must be reconciled, and again, you cannot just assume that after time goes by, you don't have to repent of it, you don't have to have it forgiven, that God just wipes it away automatically, and, and, and it's just, it, everything's okay between you and God, you did a few good deeds to count up for it, and everything's okay, but it's not. Only Christ can make the reconciliation for our sins, so that we are no longer in debt anymore. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Sucker means to bring them in to his bosom and give them comfort and assurance that the debt is paid. Somebody say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 6. I want you to turn here and I want you to look at this in your Bible. I think something that we all deal with is unforgiveness to somebody that has sinned against us or sinned in our sight or we heard about it or whatever. I've dealt with it in some cases not very successfully. But I think the Bible makes this absolutely clear. You cannot be forgiven by God until you forgive others. After this manner, pray ye, our Father, which, say this out loud with me, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If we are Christians, then we must allow God to soften our hearts against those who have sinned, those who have transgressed against us, or those whom we know that have transgressed against God. I know that gossip goes around and we talk about people. I know that happens. I've done it. You've done it. So let's just admit it and let's deal with it. What we do is we hear about what somebody else does and we shake our heads and act like that's terrible, that's bad. But we're just as guilty. And if there's one thing that I've learned, being a pastor, being a husband, being a dad, being a Christian, I have to forgive others. And sometimes when I don't want to, God says, but you asked me to forgive you of what you did. Why is it now that you're not willing to forgive others of what they did? And then I say, God, you're right! I don't like it, but I got to do it. Now, let me add to that. Sometimes things happen with people. We can forgive and then move on. Does it always mean that we have to have the picnic together? Does it always mean that we have to bunk together? Does it always mean that we can get along? But... Paul and John Mark got into it in the book of Acts. Barnabas separated them. God forgave them both. I'm sure they would have forgiven each other. And God blessed both of them. Mark gets to write the gospel of Mark. Paul gets to write most of the New Testament. It is obvious that God was in them both and worked through them both. And it's obvious that they just, sometimes we just have to move on. But you, you got to forgive. Okay? Turn to Deuteronomy 15. The law, man, I love this. God, God hit me with this this morning about what this means. God built love into the law. In the Old Testament, God gave them ten commandments. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam one commandment. He broke that. Then Moses comes along, God gives them ten commandments. They broke that, we broke that. Jesus comes along and distills all of the law and the commandments down into two. Two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto the others as you would have them do unto you is what that means. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, you can see clearly that part of the Ten Commandments are our love directed toward God. Uh, there is no, let, no other gods before thee. Take, don't take the Lord's name in vain. There should not make unto thee any graven images. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and mother. That's a transition one because God is our father. Heaven's our mother. So we love that. Then we love our earthly mother and father. Then we move on. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Those commandments are given. And if you boil it down to just two laws, it is love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love thy neighbor as thyself. And you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have one without the other. I, last Sunday morning, Reg Kelly preached hard against Mike Hoggard. I listened to a message and I'll tell you what, I wept and I cried and I begged God's mercy and I wrote four sermons out of that one that I heard. 
And it was good, but I needed that. But you know what he said? He said, the greatest sin that I've ever committed, I encourage you to go listen to it. The greatest sin I've ever committed was I didn't love God. When you think about your sin, I'm saying your sin. When you think about you doing your sin, that is you did it because you loved you first. You may have sinned against other people. You know what David said? And this made sense when he said it. I've been reading Psalm 51. David said against thee and thee only have I sinned. And yet he took Bathsheba. He had Uriah the Hittite killed. Nathan the prophet said you've done this in the face of all Israel. Everybody in Israel knows this. Surely he meant that he sinned against God mostly. But he didn't sin against everybody else too. But no. What he said was against thee and thee only have I sinned. And his sin was that he didn't love God first. And you take that, it'll all boil down to that. You didn't love God. You loved yourself before you loved Him or anybody else. Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. If there be among you a poor man, raise your hand if you're poor. You're poor. You're, you're full of sin and you racked up a debt you cannot pay. There be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not harden thine heart nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. That's why we're going to give him 4,000 pounds of beans and corn. I think we need to go to Kenya and teach him how to make beans and cornbread. Amen. Put some bacon in there, some ham hock. Amen. Maybe they don't know how to fix it right. We'll just go over there and fix it for them. Amen. We're going to give them 4,000 4, pounds. Because they're poor. And we're not. And we're not supposed to harden our heart against our brothers. And they're our brothers. Verse 8. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not. And he cried unto the Lord against thee, and it be a sin unto thee. Let me explain that. He said, Every six years, you're gonna, you can lend, but on the seventh year, it's a release. Whatever somebody, if anybody owes you a debt in the seventh year, that debt's cleared on the seventh year. And so in the sixth year, you had guys that were going to people saying, I need to borrow this, I need to borrow that. And the people wouldn't loan it. You know why? The seventh year is coming up. I'm not going to get paid back. If, if you've got enough to loan out, you know what that means? You've got enough. We're not supposed to be that way. And God said, guess what? If you don't lend to him, he's going to cry unto me and I'm going to know what you did. You think you got enough now? You just wait. You think you're not going to loan anything because, well, the seventh year's coming up and he, not, he don't have to pay it back. God said, you just wait. Then we'll see who the borrow is the year after that. We'll, I'll turn this thing around and I'll make that guy rich and I'll make you be going to him. Hey, you, you don't think that's right? Listen, there was a time when countries borrowed from us. And now we're having to borrow from everybody else. God, this Bible's right. So, verse 10. Thou shalt surely give him and, and thine heart shall not be grieved. When thou givest unto him, because that for this thing, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. God will bless that. God will bless you when you find $40 in the cash drawer. And you don't stick that in your pocket and walk off. Did you hear what that lady said? She came in, and when she saw Lynn with that money, she said, that was supposed to go to my daughter. 
That was supposed to go to her daughter, not her. Lynn, you did the right thing again. Verse 11. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. All the liberals in this country think that they're going to eliminate poverty. They're not. They think they're going to eliminate poverty by raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. All they're doing is increasing the price of a hamburger. That's all. But it, see, it makes them look good. It gets them elected. But people who don't understand even the base economics don't understand that then the price of everything has to go up and what they can't afford now, making $8 an hour, they're not going to be able to afford when they're making $15 an hour because everything else is going up. You go back and go to YouTube and watch old episodes of The Price is Right and look at how much a new car was being given away for back in 1978. This car now is $8,900. Are you kidding me? That's how it works. We're always going to have poor people. I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, and to thy poor, and to the needy in thy land. God said we got to do it. Can I get amen out of God's people? Now look at verse 12. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year, thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock. That's the only thing God tells us to be liberal at. Liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor. And that means your garner. Where you store your grain. And out of thy wine press. Of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. Not loan it again. Give it to him. So put this now, put yourself in the shoes, not of the collector, but of the debtor. When God forgives you, I read a verse this morning, bless my heart out of the book of Psalms. God says he delights in being merciful. God kind of skips a little bit when somebody says, God, forgive me. Yes, I get to forgive them. God said, I delight in mercy. So you've been forgiven. And you're worried now. Well, God, what if I mess up? Because I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I want to do right, but I don't think I can. God says, I'll forgive you. I'll delight in it. I'll do it freely. I'll do it liberally. I'll give you, in fact, I'll give you 66 books of riches like you've never had before. In verse 15, thou shalt remember, listen to this now, thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. You used to be a slave. You used to be down in the pit. You used to be down in the dirt. You used to be in bondage. And God, the Lord thy God, redeemed thee. Therefore, I command thee this thing today. God is, listen, this is a commandment that you love your neighbor. And it shall be, if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee in thine house. You look at this now. Do you love God? Do you love God? Do you love God? I will make you say it. Do you love God? Do you love God's house? The two go together. The two go together. This man said, I want to come and be in God's house at Bethel. And he was going to tell me what he likes out of what I do. And I was thinking, he's going, he's going to say, I like the Watchman broadcast, or I like Pastor Mike online. And he said, he said, I like that you stream the church service. It's for your wife. For his wife. You love God. You got to love his house. 
they go together. And he said, I will not go away from thee because he loveth thee in thine house because he is well with thee. This is you now. When God saved you, he said, you're free. No more debt. I'm going to send you 20 head of cattle, a thousand pounds worth of grain, and I've got two servants I'm going to send with you, and that'll get you on your feet until the crops come in next year. Would that be enough? Oh, yeah, it'd be more than enough. That's what I'm with. That's what my God has given me to give to you. So I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to do it freely. You don't owe me for this. So that's you that are, here's this man that took you in. And he's letting you pay off the debt, but now he's setting you free and he's doing it out of a loving heart. He's hoping that you never have to borrow again. And you turn around and you look at this man. And you say, you know what? I'm not a good farmer. I don't do well with crops. I'm not good at animal husbandry. I can't, it just seems like I can't make them calve. The reason why I'm in debt is that when my dad died, I took over the farm and I just don't do well with it. Can I stay here with you? And serve you the rest of my life. That's, that's, that's that law. Verse 7. Then thou shalt take an awl. Thrust it through his ear under the door. Put a hole in his ear. And put it all in there. And make a hole in there. And he shall be thy servant. For how long? Forever. And also unto thy maidservant. Thou shalt do likewise. It shall not seem hard unto thee when thou sendest him away for free from thee, for he hath been worth a double hired servant to thee in serving thee six years. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all that thou doest. Paul said, Romans chapter one, Paul said, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. You know why? Paul knew the law. Paul knew on the road to Damascus, he's going to kill saints. He's going to kill churches. He's going to go kill some preachers. He's going to go attack the house of God. And God stopped him. And God saved him. And God changed his heart. And God set him free from all of his sins. And Paul, he said, now Paul, you're free. You can go do whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. Do whatever you want. You don't owe me a thing. And Paul said, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. You've been set free. You don't owe a debt. And God here sends you out with everything that you need to get going on your own. You don't have to come back. But you came back. And said, I'll serve you. 1 Corinthians 7. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou be, as me made, be free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be ye not the servants of men. We stand as the servants of Jesus Christ, set free. We don't do it out of debt. We don't do it because we owe him anything. We do it because he loved us enough to pay our debts. And he's going to take care of us. And he's going to feed us. And he's going to let us be in his house forever. Somebody say amen. That's it. That's all I got to preach. You've been set free. You don't have a debt. You won't have, listen to me, you won't have one for the rest of your life. You'll never, ever, ever be in debt again. Because of the liberalness of God and His mercy. He set you free. And we don't come here, this, see this is the difference. 
I could try to make you feel guilty about what you're not doing for God. I don't want you to feel guilty. And then do something. It would be better, and I know this, it would be better if you did it because you wanted to, not because you had to. And that is the difference that Christ makes in us. I read my Bible because I want to. I preach the messages because I want to. I serve this church because that's all I want to do. And I want to do it freely. And I want you to have a heart in you that you serve God because you want to. When we had a school here, we had students, we had to make them do every little thing. And they hated us. And to this day, some of them hate us because we made them do things they did not want to do. And then we had students. They came in, they filled out their gold card, they sat and they did their work. And when they got done at one o'clock, they were done. They did it because they wanted to do it. And you have to decide which one you are. You young people, you're going to grow up. And I worry about every one of you. Like I worried about my own. Because at some point, Lisa and I realized we couldn't make them come to church. They had to do it. Because they wanted to. Can't make them read the Bible anymore. It's not in their, their schoolwork. They're going to have to do it because they want to do it. And to all of you young people, at some point, mom and daddy's going to let go. They're not going to like it, but they're going to have to. And you're either going to serve God or you're not. But you're going to do it because that's what you want to do. And we don't want anybody here that thinks they have to be here. I want you here because you want to be here. And you want to serve God. Father in heaven. I don't know what else to say. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And God you do in hearts what you want to do in hearts. And God I love every one of these people. I love the ones, Father, that could not come today. And Lord, I love the ones who don't, didn't come today for whatever reason. And Lord, I know, God, that there's some people struggling right now. And they're not here. And I love them. And God, if I, if I could do anything for them to get them in the house of God, I'd do it. And God, you have done everything. And the choice is theirs. They're either going to serve you because they want to, or they're not. It's their choice. But God, you set me free. You paid a debt for me, God, that I was way over my head in. And I knew, God, I could not get out of it. On my own. And when you made me free. I came to you. And I said God I'm yours. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll do it. And I know God that I don't owe you anything. But I'm glad. And happy. To be in your house. Serving you. Never begrudgingly. Never upset over it. Glad to do it. 
God, that I, I would, that you would instill in every heart gladness, gladness at serving you, gladness at being in your house in the service of the Lord. Father, just speak to hearts gently, kindly, God, pleading with them, reminding them, Lord, of the debt that was forgiven and how you set them free. And they don't have to serve you, but it's there if they want it. And God, I don't see how anybody, after being forgiven, God, that they would walk away from you. I don't see how they could do that. So God, plead with people and make them the offer that they can serve you for the rest of their life, free and yet in service to you. Thank you, God, for setting me free and for making me free. And thank you, God, for the grace and the liberty that is in Christ Jesus. Father, I want to preach to all the people in Kenya and all the Roman Catholics and all the Seventh-day law keepers and everybody, Lord, that's in bondage to witchcraft and voodoo and idols. God, that they can be set free and not have to do any of that ever again. They can be made free by the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what I want them to hear, Father. It's a blessing and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Would you stand to your feet? I'm glad we didn't call church off. Amen. Come back and be with us at 4 o'clock. Parking lots. God cleared the parking lot for us. Be, be careful going out to your cars. Be careful getting home, coming back. Come be with us 4 o'clock tonight, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. Barring another snowstorm, we'll be here. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. God bless you. I love you. It's good to have you with us. Brother Sterling, close us in prayer, please.